Warning. You're about to hear unfiltered insights about regenerative agriculture and our sovereign right to natural food. This is not just a podcast, but a patriotic movement against the tide of food ignorance and corporate food giants shaping our modern food system. It's time to feed the people. Hello. Hey, Brooke. Brooks. Mr. Bullard, how is everybody today? Doing good. Good. Doing good. Good. You know, today I'm super excited for our guest, somebody uh, that has been providing a lot of education for myself as I continue to try to learn um, the challenges that face our food supply chain, that face agriculture, that face the producers in our nation. As many of you guys know, my family, uh, five generations of ranching all the way back to homesteading the Southern, uh, Southern Utah, the Arizona Strip in 1916, the Bundy Ranchers. Um, we kind of t- tend to pick hills to stand on and we don't back down whether people fully agree or not, uh, but that's just kind of in our blood. You know, and obviously, Brooke, your Southern Utah, our family's built St. George. <laughs> so, um, but and today's- I'm, full, I'm yeah. full of blood that I grew up people saying, the Enses and Thompsons never should have mixed. <laughs> we are fire, fiery, yeah. fiery bunch. Yeah, that's like maybe that's hap- what happens when you're pushing ki- livestock in the desert uh, <laughs> as a founding fa- as founding family member. But, uh, you know, today everybody, um, our guest is Bill Bullard. He's the CEO of RCAF USA. RCAF was founded in 1999, and Bill has been the, the leading that organization. Um, Bill, how, how long have you been with RCAF at this point? Mr. Bullard, go ahead and pull yourself off a of mute there, sir. Perfect. There we I'm go. sorry. A little over 20 years. A little over 20 years. And how long have you been in the role of CEO for this organization? A little over 20 years. All right. Okay, great. So right, jumped right in. That's awesome. Well, Bill, I'm I'm just grateful to have you here. I know you've been in. Give us a little bit of your background in in livestock. Born and raised doing this. What's your family's heritage and and where do you come from? Well, I'm a former rancher from Northwest South Dakota. Had a 300 head cow calf operation. <laughs> um, struggled through the 1980s and left the ranch with a family. Went back to college and uh, circled back here representing cow calf producers. So I made the full circle. I was a cow calf producer. Now I represent them. Yeah. Excellent. And so uh, obviously as a cow calf producer, dealing with the challenges that come from, you know, typically men in suits and politics, what uh, did you all, when did you realize you were going to get into the political side of what was going on? What was that like for you? Well, that's actually while I was still ranching, uh, recognized that we had concentration issues where we had very few packers controlling the marketplace. Uh, We did not have a competitive, uh, robustly competitive market. And so uh, began began back then, and that was back in the mid-1980s. Mid-1980s, okay. And what's that been like? I guess like the better way to say it, what's the, how, how eye-opening has it been for you to get in, more involved in the political side to understand the decisions that were being made on your behalf, whether you wanted them or not? Well, I think the uh, thing that was most alarming was the significant power that the multinational meat packers have in Washington, D.C., and even trickling down into the states, you know, where they make contributions to state universities, um, and have significant power within state governments. And, uh, you know, we're dealing with some of the most powerful political and economic forces in our economy. And it's directly affecting consumers, as we're going to talk about here. And, uh, of course, it's, it's hurting and injuring uh, our family farm and ranch system of agriculture all across America. Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, that I, too, have been come, become very clear on is that People, 
what, you know, what Brooke and I, we're creating this software to connect consumers directly with producers nationwide. Our goal is to cut out all the middlemen, except for those that are necessary, like your small local slaughterhouses, the, the, the locker mm-hmm. plants. I ran one of those here in Cody, Wyoming, and then consulted for a new one being built in Richfield. So outside of those, like you're saying, the multinational corporations, it's it's become very clear, especially in the last few years, we have a country run by corporations, not by politics. The politics get paid for by the corporations, and then the decisions are made in that order. Is that is that what you kind of pick noticed in the in the beef space as well in the cattle space? Well, particularly back uh, about four decades ago, or since four decades ago, the government has had this laissez-faire mentality and have decided that they were not going to enforce our antitrust laws to prevent monopolies and monopoly conduct in the marketplace. They were not going to enforce the Packers and Stockyards Act, which is an act that Congress passed specifically uh, to prevent uh, abusive conduct by the highly concentrated meat packers. And so under that uh, hands-off approach of government, we allowed the multinational meat packers to essentially uh, uh, redesign a uh, the legal framework, the political framework, and the regulatory framework in which they operate. So they devised a framework that benefited them at the expense of producers on one end of the food supply chain and consumers on the other. And one of the ways that uh, they, they changed um, policies to benefit themselves was they forced the United States to relax its import standards, for example. Up until 1995, we used to require foreign meatpacking plants to have food safety standards that were at least equal to those of the United States. But we entered the World Trade Organization in 1995, and the World Trade Organization said to the United States, your standards are too high. Uh, If you maintain those standards, we can't facilitate imports from various countries into the United States. So the United States uh, complied and relaxed that equal to standard. And now it's an equivalency standard. It simply says that these foreign countries, food safety standards need to be close enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in in that case, we would allow imports into this country. And that's facilitated large volumes of imports from many, many countries that we would not otherwise import from or allow imports uh, from. And another example is that uh, we used to to go and physically inspect foreign meatpacking plants every month in order for them to maintain their certification uh, to ship beef to the United States. We don't do that anymore. Again, back in the mid 1990s, as a result of the World Trade Organization, the United States relaxed the standard and now it's only periodic inspections of foreign meatpacking plants. That means it could happen six months, uh, you know, interims or intervals of six months or a year, and then just be a paperwork uh, review of a country's standards. And that's why back uh, just a few years ago, we had to shut down the border to Brazil Mm. because Brazil was not meeting food safety standards. We had no knowledge of it until other countries began to close their borders to Brazilian beef. And then we found out that they were uh, applying uh, toxic uh, chemicals to the beef. From from what you're saying, my understanding in, in looking at the history four decades ago, that was in the 80s when Reagan changed those antitrust laws. But back then, my understanding, there's only they only controlled about 25 percent of the marketplace. Of course, the names of the companies and there were there were more than just four then. But the result of that is now four. And when you, it, what's also fascinating, it's the, the issue that we had with Brazil. And yet two of our four primary companies are Brazilian. Right. Yeah. So just over a generation ago, this would be 1980, uh, we had the four largest packers controlled 36% of the market. Today, the four largest packers control 85% of the fed cattle market and nearly 85% of the box beef market. And two of those four largest packers are Brazilian owned. They're JBS and Marfrig. So half the largest packers that have an unprecedented level of uh, market power over independent cattle producers and consumers, half of them are foreign from Brazil. Yeah. And so staying on this right now, since we're talking about it, JBS is trying to push for uh, getting on the New York Stock Exchange, being a publicly traded company. In your experience, what's the 
what would that lead to? If they're successful, what are we dealing with at that point? Well, let, let me uh, back up and provide a qualification. So we filed a national class action antitrust lawsuit against the four largest Packers, including JBS, Marfrig, Cargill, and Tyson. And we allege that those four Packers have violated our antitrust laws by uh, engaging in collusion. And we allege that they have artificially depressed prices paid to producers while simultaneously inflating prices that consumers pay for beef in the grocery store. As a result of that lawsuit, I, I'm not able to discuss JBS, uh, its other ventures at this point in time. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, well, let's uh, jump into one of the first topics I, I, that we're pretty much on now anyway, which is the MCOOL, Mandatory Country of Origin Labeling, which was a requirement at one point and now has been repealed. Uh, I'm going to have Brooks play our first clip with um, Congresswoman Hageman, and we'll go from there. And I have Democrats in support of this because they recognize that it is a food freedom issue and it is a consumer protection issue. And I let me jump in, Jaden. I think that's a really great point to uh, point out, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, is that this is a liberty issue. Um, we owe it to our consumer to provide them the freedom of choice. And without that freedom of choice, they don't they don't know what they're buying in the store. And, uh, you know, it it's an oxymoron to me for us to be shipping uh, American beef across the the pond to other countries and label it over there but we don't want it labeled here it just blows my mind but it is truly a liberty and freedom issue and we need to we need to honor our our consumer in a greater way by providing them that freedom it's a benefit to the consumer and the producer both so mandatory country of origin labeling which means if you bought a package of beef it would tell you where it came from so that as the consumer who's walking down the grocery store, who's got all probably in many cases now because of the urbanization that's happening in the U.S., they've never if their grandfather wasn't in farming or ranching or anything, they don't have a clue what the process is. And so now I'm walking down the grocery store and everything says USA. So what tell us a little bit about the details, like what changed? Why, why did we go from being a mandatory country of origin labeling to not what happened there? So we were successful in passing mandatory country of origin labeling back in 2002. And that's why when you go to the grocery store today, you'll see product of Peru, product of uh, Uruguay um, on fruits and vegetables. They'll all have a sticker product of USA. You'll see it on your fish and your shellfish. You'll see it on um, uh, various nuts. Uh, peanuts, for example. So there has been a mandatory requirement that food be labeled as to its origin. And beef and pork were included back in 2002. But the meat packers fought back vehemently and prevented the U.S. Department of Agriculture from uh, writing regulations to implement the law. So the law wasn't even implemented until 2009. And at the time, it was only partially implemented for beef. Um, meanwhile, consumers still are able to see the labels on chicken and lamb and fish and the other uh, commodities I talked about. So country of origin labeling was finally implemented properly in May of 2013. At that time, the U.S. Department of Agriculture said that all beef sold in grocery stores had to be labeled as to where the animal from which the beef was derived was born, raised, and slaughtered. So consumers knew whether or not uh, the beef that they were buying was an imported product and all imported products. So we import from 20 different countries. So products coming in from Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Bar Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Canada, all 20 countries that we import from were required to have the beef labeled as it crossed U.S. Board Customs and Border Protection. And U.S. Customs and Border Protection required those labels to remain intact all the way to the consumer. So consumers knew if the beef was foreign. The consumer knew if the beef was exclusively produced by America's family farmers and ranchers or if the beef was partially imported. For example, imported as a live animal, brought into the United States and then slaughtered here, then it would have a label said born in Canada or Mexico, for example, uh, raised and slaughtered in the United States. But consumers had the choice. 
So if meat packers want to control the industry, the first thing they have to do is they have to eliminate competition and replace it with top-down corporate control. So their goal is to eliminate competition. So competition in, in our marketplace in the United States begins with the consumer. As you said, the consumer exercises choice in the grocery store. Based on the consumer's choice, the consumer's purchasing is actually sending competitive demand signals upstream in the supply chain. So if a consumer goes to the grocery store and has a choice between an Argentinian steak, a Uruguayan steak, or a Brazilian steak, or a U.S. steak, and if the consumer selects the U.S. steak, then they're sending a demand signal directly to the packer, telling the packer where they must go to source beef to replace that purchase. And the packer would have no choice. The packer has to go to the U.S. cattle producer in order to replenish that inventory that the consumer had purchased. That's how competition works. So the meat packer's primary goal is to prevent competition from occurring so they don't want consumers to have a choice. That's why they fought vehemently to repeal country of origin labeling just two years after it was implemented. So in 2015, the meat packers were successful. Congress shook in its boots because the World Trade Organization in Geneva um, said that this was just too difficult for foreign countries to have to comply uh, with the labeling requirement. And so the Congress repealed country of origin labeling for beef and pork, mm -hmm. not for chicken, not for goats, not for lamb, not for fruits and vegetables, and not for peanuts, and not for fish and farm raised fish only for beef and pork. That tells you where the power lies uh, in the meatpacking industry. And so today we do not have mandatory country of origin labeling. The consumer goes to the grocery store and does not know from which of the 20 countries the beef setting in the grocery aisle or the shelf uh, originated. And it's even worse than that because once Congress repealed the mandatory country of origin labeling requirement for beef sold in grocery stores, we re reverted back to the pre-country of origin labeling era when the U.S. Department of Agriculture was trying to help the packers bring in more imports. And the way they did that was they, they had a policy that said that a packer could, purchase, could import beef from Uruguay, a steak from Uruguay, for example, exclusively produced in Uruguay, born, raised, and slaughtered in Uruguay could bring it across the border, pass U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and then bring that Uruguayan steak into U.S. processing plant. And there they can unwrap that steak product and then put a new wrapper on the steak product and put a product of USA label on the beef. And so today, as we sit here, and this has been going on since 2015, as we sit here today, you can walk in a grocery store and see a beef product that proudly says, product of the USA, and that beef product is as likely as not to have been imported from any one of those 20 countries that we import from. And all, all that happened in the United States is it was unwrapped and rewrapped. Jeez. So consumers are being deceived terribly. And of course, U.S. cattle farmers and ranchers are being harmed because this beef is a direct substitute and it is displacing their opportunity to produce beef for the American citizen. And the meat packers are laughing all the way to the bank. And then you add on top of that, when they add the um, uh, L, what's the product called? The the fat, the LB. The, the, the lean yeah. um, automated trimmings. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And so they, my understanding is that, filler. yeah, the filler, they'll add a, like 13% of that filler to a pound of beef, which drives the cost they have to sell it at to make profit. But yet, when you're buying it right from the producer, it's a single source animal that's, you know, you're buying a pound of beef. It's a pound of beef, you know, might be right. 80, 20, right. but it's from that originating animal. But, but because my understanding is the USDA said, well, there's pink on it because there might be a little sliver of, you know, of meat attached to that fat. Well, because it's pink, we're going to allow you to call it meat. So you might not even be buying 80, 20 when it's labeled 80, 20 or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So this is what happens when you lack competition in a supply chain. Mm, yeah. Um, Paraguay is a hot topic right now, too, because we there was an importation of Paraguayan beef at one point and then it went away and it's back again. Speak to that a little bit for us. And so uh, 
Paraguay is among the many countries of the world that where foot and mouth disease is endemic. Now, foot and mouth disease is a highly contagious disease uh, for cloven-footed animals, two-toed animals, like cattle, like hogs, like sheep, like deer. And in 1929, we had an outbreak of foot and mouth disease because an Argentinian cruise ship ported in Los Angeles and in the garbage and the waste, uh, the foot and mouth disease virus uh, existed. And it began to spread and the United States spent, I don't know how much money, but eradicating foot and mouth disease from within our borders. So we have not had foot and mouth disease in the United States since 1929. And this is a, this is a disease that can devastate it in industry um, economically. And so uh, we have long had strong, stringent import standards to prevent the reintroduction of foot and mouth disease in the United States. South America uh, and Paraguay and Brazil and Argentina and Uruguay have all um, are not free of, of foot and mouth disease. And so the United States, this is just another example. So the United States used to prohibit the importation of beef products from any country where foot and mouth disease existed. And then they relaxed that requirement back again in the late 90s at the behest of the World Trade Organization. And the new requirement is, is the U.S. Department of Agriculture would carve out a region in a country and declare that region free of the pernicious disease and allow uh, imports to originate from that particular region within a country. And now USDA is even further relaxing the standards. So under this relaxed standard, we're importing beef from Brazil, Namibia, Africa, Argentina, and Uruguay, all countries that are not the, determined to be free of foot and mouth disease. Uh, they've had outbreaks, they've been vaccinated in many instances. Um, and now our illustrious government has decided to have one more. Now we're going to import beef from Paraguay. But something's, there's something very unique about the Paraguay decision of USDA. In fact, we understand that a shipment of Paraguayan beef arrived at the United States and it was turned away because it was uh, it, it didn't meet um, our minimal standards. And but nevertheless, this Uruguayan rule was rushed because in all the other rules where USDA was going to carve out a region in a country and allow imports, even though the foot and mouth disease virus existed, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually went down and did on-site visits within a year or two years uh, before they allowed the importation of that product. The Paraguay rule is different. The USDA relied on a nearly a 10-year-old on-site visit and a five-year-old risk analysis uh, to make the determination that Paraguayan beef is, would be safe in the United States, even though Paraguay is not free of foot and mouth disease. So this is a huge risk. Mm -hmm. It's an unavoid it's an avoidable risk and it's an unnecessary risk, but there's some geopolitical implications here. The United States wants to be friendly with Paraguay um, as it relates to our relationships with Taiwan and U Ukraine. And one way to uh, to satisfy Paraguay and keep them as an ally is to leverage our food safety. And that's what the government is doing. And yeah, because we'll just, you know, we'll just make another vaccine for it, you know? <laughs> ah, yeah, I know. But we've, we've got lots of pharmaceuticals that are really good. So, yeah, we, it'll be, we'll, we'll let it slide. You can get a shot for that. Right, right. You can uh, get a shot for it. So, um, so this is a huge problem. Yeah. yeah and it, it's, it's just simply really gets my blood boiling. Continues to demonstrate <laughs> how powerful the multinational meat packers are in our uh, republic form of government. It, it, yeah, I mean, we're already, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these numbers, because some of them I'm just repeating from, you know, sources, and they may not all be true, but we're at the number of cattle that we've had in our country since 1950. Texas just had a, is dealing with a massive wildfire that's killing off thousands of head of cattle. We're not even into the droughts of the season yet. And, and it's snowing. Yeah. It's snowing there. Yeah. <laughs> so insane. I, I mean, so just when it comes to like, what, what we really try to teach is food security, food stability because of the fragility of our supply chain, because of what's happened to our producers over the decades as we've, as we've lost so many of them and replace that with imports. And hopefully the, the cargo ships, and I say hopefully, I don't, we don't want this, but we're in a position now, 
we are dependent on them, but we need to start making the change to, to something different in the future. But right now we're dependent. If we stopped imports today, we wouldn't have enough food. But now you're adding all of these other threats to our food supply chain that's already so sh- small and fragile. It, it just, it's, fr- right. people just need to become, I mean, we need, it's our job, I guess, those that are in the industry, like you've been doing and we're, we're doing to try to help educate. So the consumer who's been, uh, he, they, they've enjoyed the luxuries of complacency and comfort for a long time. And that yeah. it's coming home to roost. And these are more things that we have to work against. Well, and I feel like this is definitely just a, a theory and kind of an assumption, but in a way for customers, people that are very disconnected from producers and from what it takes to create food, right? Growing it, all the, all the stuff. I could almost see through media creating a weird back of your mind stigma of anything that's from here. Hmm. Almost demonizing the, the industry, demonizing ranching, demonizing cows to where people may be like more okay or almost think that if, if it's being imported, like, oh, that's fancier, like that's better. Oh, they do it better over there, which is completely backwards. So I hope people listen to this and actually hear, you know, what you're really gambling when you're just going to the grocery store and just buying what they have there. Yeah. It's it, to solve, a, to really start solving problems, stop going to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Know your producer, keep them in business. Like that is what me and me and AJ are in the business of keeping them in the business. Yeah. So if you look at the cattle industry, uh, cattle have the longest biological cycle of any animal because it takes about three years to breed a cow, birth the calf, raise the calf to slaughter weight. Um, And at the time it's at slaughter weight, it's gonna be 15 to, to 24 months old. And so how that animal was raised under the production standards of a particular country has everything to do with the safety and wholesomeness of the resultant beef product. So the water the animal drank, the the quality of feed the animal ate, uh, the veterinary biologics used in the animal, if any, um, all of that matters in, in how safe that final beef product is. We don't require foreign countries to meet the same production standards that we have in the United States. The standards that we require all begin at the slaughtering plant. So they determine whether or not that is um, equivalent to the United States, not equal to. Um, And so that's why we make the claim that it remains uncontested. We produce the best beef in the world and we do it under the best of conditions for citizens. And the multinational meat packers don't want consumers to know that uh, because they can source this cheaper beef. And AJ, you you talked about um, what we used to have. So we only have to go back just over a generation, four decades ago. And we then relied upon a family farm system of food production in the United States. That's a widely disaggregated system consisting of millions of farmers and ranchers all across the United States producing food. But we went through this era of consolidation and where largeness of scale trumped competition. So that's where industrial agriculture entered the arena. So we began to centralize, we began to consolidate, we began to eliminate all those pesky farmers and ranchers. Is this the, uh, so, Earl, is this the Earl Butts get big or get out conversation or is this? Pretty much that, okay. that, is, that has followed this. Um, but there was uh, for antitrust law enforcement, So long as uh, a a emerging company or a monopoly could prove that it's more efficient um, being larger with an economy of scale, then antitrust laws were not enforced because they viewed efficiency as far more important than competitiveness and, and the potential loss of competition. So that's what happened. So back in 1980, um, you might remember traveling across the countryside that virtually most farms had hogs. Mm. And at the time back in a generation ago, there were 667,000 hog producers scattered all across the United States. And then through this uh, largeness of scale favoritism and the concentration and consolidation, 
In the course of four decades, we wiped out nine out of every 10 hog producers. So now we have 61,000 hog producers left, 90% of them are gone. And we have Smithfield Farms, which is Chinese owned, is the largest pork producer in the United States. And, and then during the COVID pandemic, what did they have to do? They had to kill, euthanize millions of hogs because they had centralized a supply chain and made it extremely vulnerable to shocks, shocks like a climatic shock, shock like a economic shock, or in this case, a disease related shock. So now we jump to the cattle industry. We're following in the hog industry's footsteps. We're becoming vertically integrated and controlled by just a handful of corporations. So we go back a generation ago, we had 1.3 million cattle producers scattered all across the United States. We've lost over half of them today. We're down to 622,000 uh, cattle producers. So we now have fewer cattle producers than when the hog uh, industry started its rapid decline uh, back four, gen four uh, decades ago. And so we've shrunk and we've centralized and we've created much larger industrialized cattle production sectors, uh, wiping out over half of the, the producers. In fact, in just the last five years, because the new census just came out, the 2022 census just came out. From 2017 to 2022, we wiped out another 107,000 independent cattle producers from, this, from America. That's a loss rate of over 20,000 producers exiting the industry per year. That has national food security implications because this once disaggregated family farm system, we were the envy of the world. We produced the highest quality food. It was efficient um, and it was, it, it was an abundant supply. We never ran out. 2022, consumers went to the grocery store and for the first time in history, they could not buy the meat they needed for the family. Mm -hmm. It's because we're headed in the wrong direction. We've got to reverse the direction that the meat packers have laid out for Congress to follow and Congress has dutifully followed them. And now as uh, American citizens, as producers, as consumers, it's a time, it's time for us to say, we're done with this. We, we have done better, we will do better again we must reform uh, our industry. Do you, do you feel like the MCOOL is one of the most important places to start with that? So the, the reason mandatory country of origin labeling is so critically important is because that's where competition begins. Mm -hmm. We cannot have competition. And I talked earlier about upstream of the supply chain. So you've got the consumer purchasing uh, beef in the grocery store, making choices, initiating signals. So those signals go uh, from the retailer back to the packer, back to the corporate feedlot, back to the person who backgrounds the animal and raises it, back to the cow-calf producer, back even to the seed stock producer who, who is, is, you know, working to improve genetics uh, by raising bulls and selling them to other farmers and ranchers. So that entire supply chain will not be competitive if the consumer can't make that choice at the grocery store. That's why country awards and labeling is so important because it, re it reignites competition, it restores competition, and it's in the consumer's hands to do that. And until we can put that in the consumer's hands, we will not have competition. And the only way consumers can be empowered uh, to initiate those demand signals is if they are informed as to where the animal was born, raised, and harvested or slaughtered. Man. Okay, I, I, we're going to play this next clip. And Bill, we're gonna, I'm going to step in it a little bit, if you know the phrase. Uh, I didn't realize when I joined RCAF that I was picking a side. I'm proud of the side I picked. But of the other organizations that exist that are supposed to be out there to support the, in, the cattle producer, it's become very clear that uh, maybe those legacy groups, they've been bought out. I mean, that's the simple term, right? Just like some, you know, they might have had a really valuable intention when they got started, but give it long enough and changes enough hands so the, the, the core mission of why they started kind of gets diluted. And we see changes. And of course, I'm talking about the NCBA. So, uh, Brooks, go ahead and play that next clip. And we'll just piss. What are your thoughts? Just an open thought. Put you on the spot. Like country of origin labeling and such. Where, where it's 
here we are again promoting U.S. or, or Kansas beef for labeling. So, so again, I, you know, I, the Kansas Beef Council doesn't really have an opinion on that. Um, so I probably won't answer that. Um, we don't lobby. So I, I would say that that's probably more of a lobbying issue. Do you think instead of the lobbying issue, do you think it would be more of a promotional issue? You know, um, Hmm. What's my opinion of country of origin labeling? Again, I don't have one. So we're done. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Pass the buck. I don't have one. I'm in this position. You guys are supposed to trust me, but I don't have an opinion on um, if our beef or anything in our country should be labeled <laughs> properly. From, from an organization that's supposed to represent the American producer. Um. I, I, we met uh, uh, Senator Masty. I will. I will yeah, just say yeah. at this point, way before now. But okay, at this point, with everything that we're dealing with, for people that are paying attention, it's pretty easy to know if you are for it or against it. Because if you're for it and you love this way of life, you would have been fixing this shit a long time ago. Mm-hmm. So the fact that they're bought out, of course they are. Like everything else. Yeah. Just ridiculous. So, so back when the meat packers were reestablishing a, a framework that benefits them, the, the policies, the regulations, the laws that, that allowed them to do exactly what they wanted. So these meat packers are extremely powerful, but they're also extremely smart. Mm-hmm. One of the first things they did was they infiltrated all of the conventional livestock groups, the National Pork Producers Council, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the National Chicken Council. <laughs> They placed meat packers on the governing boards of all of these organizations that used to represent the interests of producers. And then now, so these organizations go to Washington and they tell Congress, what's good for the meat packer is good for the producer because they're all in this together. And the Congress bought that hook, line and sinker and has begin, begun to kowtow to those organizations that are representing their meatpacking interests and yet telling producers, um, you know, we're your organization. Hmm. And that's uh, been a huge obstacle for us to overcome. In fact, it's why we were, why we were founded back in 1999. It was in recognition that when these organizations merged with the meatpacking industry, the American farmer and rancher lost their voice in Washington, D.C. Mm. And so we were founded to replace that lost voice. Uh, but yet what we haven't done is uh, had the opportunity to overcome the significant financial um, disparity between our organization, that's a voluntary group, and organizations like uh, the National Cattle and Beef Association that receives $40 million a year from a government subsidy called the Beef Checkoff Program. Yeah. Well, that's definitely going to lead us into that program. I think one one thing I would say before we talk about the checkoff is Massey came to Utah. We met with him, and he did a, a really great presentation. He said, at the ver- at your local level, you can, probably, you can probably trust or count on your Farm Bureau and your your local cattle association. But when you start getting towards state and certainly at federal, there's no more trust. They've all been bought out. They're not working on your behalf. And so when I, you know, listen to this clip and I'm like, Oh yeah, okay. That's, that's what he's speaking of. And, and they don't want to bite the hand that feeds him, so to say. So that's why he didn't want to respond to it because he knows his bosses are going to review that footage and, and not be okay with that. And I reached out to, uh, after the RCAF convention and after I, I did a video uh, and this, I guess will lead us into the, the checkoff. I did a video after listening to one of yours and it took me some time to process the, the industry speak of what you're sharing and like, how can I share this in a way that the average consumer will hear it in the way that it matters for them. And I, I don't know that I did a great job with it, but essentially what I said is, a producer is paying about a dollar for every animal sold. And the purpose of the checkoff is so that they can market the value of beef to consumers. Well, all we're hearing right now 
is cows are the problem with the environment. We should consider fake meat, all these other things. And so I just posed the question. I said, either it's willful neglect by the NCBA and anybody responsible for the checkoff dollars. It's will they're willfully not doing anything to go against it for who knows why I'm not in their offices. I have, you know, I can certainly come up, come up with some tinfoil hat conspiracies on why, but, but I don't know. Or secondly, their knowledge of how to reach the consumer is so antiquated that they need to overhaul their own interior group of people and learn how to use TikTok and Instagram and Facebook to meet the consumer where they're at. Because the last time they did anything of value was beef. It's what's for dinner. And how old is that? You ask any person in their you know mid to younger 30s, and they have probably never heard that that slogan. And so, which is it? Willful neglect or intentional uh, intentional neglect? So that, that that put me on the radar. So I asked this this woman that that speaks in ag, and I'm like, "How do you get on the speaking rod? I'd like to you know go out there and see if I can help move the needle a little bit." And she goes, "She said, she goes, I saw your checkoff video and the support of all our cap. You kind of picked the side, and I was like." there's a side, <laughs> you know, this is, this, I'm still naive enough that I didn't really understand the the NCBA and how they've been bought out and what you guys are working towards. And she said, yeah, I'm like, oh, well, didn't want to speak for those to those people anyway, I guess. So um, moving into the, the, the checkoff describe for us from your, from your understanding, the purpose of the checkoff, what it was supposed to do. And, and now what, what you see is happening or not happening. Yeah, so the the checkoff was passed by Congress back in the mid 1980s, and it was in direct response to the economic cost price squeeze that forced many many farmers and ranchers out of the industry back then. And it was intended to promote uh, beef and to build demand for beef, and it was intended to help the American cattle farmer and rancher. So that was over 35 years ago. It's never been uh, reformed um, significantly. Um, it continues to operate just as it did back then. And what it requires is that every, as you said, every cattle producer that sells a live animal must pay $1 uh, into this government fund. And then the government uh, distributes the, the money, which is about 70 to $80 million a year. And it, the government divides it up amongst the uh, various organizations. And so what it's been doing is it's been passing the uh, the money off to organizations like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, like the U.S. Meat Export Federation. And as a result, they receive millions uh, of dollars every year from a mandated uh, checkoff program, subsidy program. And uh, the, the producer uh, is begun, has begun to realize that those organizations that are the recipients of these millions of dollars are actually working uh, to prevent the reforms that producers need. For example, both the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the U.S. Meat Export Federation helped to repeal mandatory country of origin labeling for beef and pork back in 2015. They continue to fight against that. They also fight against uh, the reforms that we seek in order to allow competition to work in cattle markets. Uh, in the United States. And so many producers feel that the government mandated dollar is uh, is leading them uh, to having to exit the industry because we cannot restore competition because the recipients of these, these government dollars are fighting against us every step of the way. Mm. And so that has caused, um, like Congressman Massey, for example, um, they're supporting a, a bill in Congress right now called the Off Act that would reform the beef checkoff. And the most significant reform is it would prohibit any organization that lobbies on behalf of agriculture from receiving any of those dollars, meaning the dollars would have to go directly to the promotion and research of, of beef, uh, which would be good. So organizations like mine, RCAF USA, could not be a recipient of checkoff dollars and should not be. Mm -hmm. you know, why, why is it necessary to run a government mandated uh, collection through a lobbying organization before it can even begin to do the work uh, that uh, Congress intended? And that is the promotion and research of beef. So we don't understand why the middleman is there other than 
um, follow, you know, the, who had the economic and political power back then. The meatpackers uh, were merging with the, the conventional organization. And this is a boon to the meatpackers. They don't have to pay for advertising. Yeah. Uh, it's being done through the producer who's uh, required to, to contribute the dollars. Yeah. And when you say meatpacker, you're talking the multinational meatpackers specifically. The, the largest of meatpackers, yeah. four largest, yes. Yeah. And my understanding, too, is that in 2000, about the time RCAF came around, we had about 10,000 slaughterhouses nationwide, and we're down to 2,500 or something like that. Yeah, so, so so I have to go back for the statistics that I have. We go back to uh, just over a generation ago. We had nearly 1,500 federally inspected meatpacking plants uh, back then in 1980, and uh, we've lost over half of them. 54% are gone today. Yeah. And so um, we've we've centralized, we've industrialized, we've concentrated, and we've made our food system vulnerable to economic shocks. And uh, not just economic, but uh, any kind of a shock to the system, climatic, disease-related, or economic. Yeah, and we, we, we saw just a taste of that in, in just after COVID. And we haven't, fu- we never even fully recovered from what COVID did to our supply chain. No, we haven't. And so we're already leaning into another election year and seeing the consequences of that potentially. What, if you, if you were president for a day and you could change the, some of this stuff, what would you do? How do you see it? I mean, this, this is, you spend your life looking at this and understanding the policies. What do you think needs to be done to revitalize the agriculture industry in our nation? What would that look like? And what kind of a timeline? What's a realistic timeline? Because that's the other thing. It's like, okay, get rid of all imports. And it's it's just American beef. Obviously, as you said, you know, like you said, it takes three years just to get an animal ready. Well, if you're holding them back to rebuild a herd, add three more years of that before that next calf is sold. And so as a professional, what does that look like? So let me use a sister livestock industry, and that's the U.S. sheep industry. So back um, four decades ago, we had um, close to 17 million sheep in the United States. And we've now reduced our sheep flock to the lowest level in history. We're down to about 5 million head. And we've wiped out over 60% of all of the sheep producers that were we consider them full-time. They had a flock of at least 100 head of sheep. And so we have destroyed the U.S. sheep industry at a time when American consumers are eating more and more lamb than they ever have in history. So we have consumption has been increasing significantly since 2012. Domestic production has been falling. Uh, Producers are exiting the industry. And the the factor that, that explains this are imports. We are importing more and more lamb from Australia, New Zealand, and they are displacing American production and forcing them out of the industry. So we've destroyed our commercial sheep industry in the United States. The solution there is you have to have some quantity limitations on the volume of imports coming into this country. So the sheep industry is one of the first livestock industries to stand up and call for tariffs. What we used to use in order to ensure that our domestic manufacturers and production facilities operated on a level playing field. And so the sheep industry is calling for tariffs and what are called tariff rate quotas. What that means is we recognize that imports can be beneficial to consumers. Um, However, if, if we do not have any controls or limits on them, they can wipe out an industry as is happening in the sheep industry. So a tariff rate quota says to a country using Australia, for example, you can import a certain volume into the United States at a low tariff rate or a zero, but a very, very low rate. But once you exceed a volume threshold where your imports begin to uh, destroy our domestic industry, we're going to charge a much higher tariff rate to dissuade you from continuing your imports. So a tariff rate quota is simply a two, two tiered tariff system. The first tier is very, very low, recognizing that consumers deserve to have a choice to eat Australian lamb, for example. 
But the second tier says, but if that Australian lamb comes without controls and because of the inherent advantage uh, that Australia has with much lower production costs, not meeting our production standards, for those various reasons, if we allow them to continue importing over that certain threshold, they will destroy our industry. We won't, we won't let that happen because it's in our food security interest. It's in our national interest to preserve it. So if I were president for a day, I would immediately begin to impose tariffs on this flood of imports uh, that is displacing the American cattle and sheep producers' ability uh, to have a profitable profitable market. And of course, uh, that would be right after I implemented mandatory country of origin labeling so consumers could initiate, uh, could um, express their preference in the grocery store. Um, and then we'd have to, because we have allowed the concentrated meat packers to gain such a significant control over the marketplace itself, we're going to have to force them to compete in one fashion or another. And so the third step would be to force the few meat packers we have uh, to actually begin competing in the market. And that would mean we have to prohibit them from exercising the inherent market power they possess simply because of the huge uh, market share that they that they're dominant in. Mm. Well, let me check in with my co-hosts here. Do you guys have any questions and comments? Go ahead. We've been running away with this. <laughs> oh no. I mean, people are people are going to be on here to listen to Bill. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But No, I just frustration. It just it, it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. All the things that we learn, all the things we've been learning, all the things that we are awake to does not surprise me at all. It's so frustrating just because it's like they've just been teeing it up for a long time. You got a, you got a, a, a country full of people that are, you know, they'll do whatever you say. They just follow along. We're all, everyone's nerves on end constantly, emotionally responding to things. And then just if you're on one side, it's a hill you're going to die on. I mean, just the conversation of, I mean, gosh, cow farts. I mean, that's a real, like, people die on that hill, die on that hill. Mm -hmm. The cows are bad. It's like, you're so, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> and I, we need more people to take that first step where they want to fix their own stupid and then come and join the conversation and realize that we can't change the past. You can't change what you did. All we can, it's okay to take responsibility and to say, man, we really screwed up. We're not going to screw up anymore, but not enough people are doing that. And I think, and I understand why, like thinking about, you know, maybe in these organizations that at the, the tip top, that's where they're really screwing us over, but there's probably people in the organization that have no idea. They have no, I, I would assume they have no idea that they're, what they're doing is as bad for us as it is. Yeah. You know, it's like, and then even if they kind of do, well, if they're taken care of, like, don't bite the hand that feeds you. We have a country of people in a, in a time where people need to stand up and use their voice, but I get it. You know, cost of living is really high, you know, although I would assume that the people that need to open up their mouths and speak the truth have more than enough money to be able to stand on that and stand in truth and figure something else out. The fear of your life changing if you stand up for something. Oh my gosh. We can't afford for people to just like live there and wait for someone else to do it. But that's what's happening. No, and people are waking up, you know, but we need it to happen fast. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a question I'd ask in, in addition to that, um, Bill, is how would you fix what's going on with the way land is managed? You know, we're in the West, so most of what we're running livestock on are leases. And, you know, my coming, and I'm going to speak at it from a very high level. I don't have enough detail and I don't want to do a disservice to my family, but, you know, um, Clive and Bundy discovered that he was paying these grazing fees that were then being utilized by those organizations to regulate him out of business. And so he kind of did his own Boston tea bar party and said, I'm not doing it. And I'm going to pay the state because that's how the constitution was supposed to be set up was after states were established, they would then assume control of the land and the federal government would get the heck out of the way. Well, federal government, you're taking these grazing fees, regulating me out of business. I'm not okay with that because I know what you're doing with those, with those fees. So I'm going to pay the state. 
and they wouldn't accept it. And he stood on that ground and that kind of what led to what happened from my understanding. And, and if I'm, you know, that's a very loose understanding from just having conversations. My point is we're talking about 90% of the West being regulated by the Bureau of Land Management decisions being made in Washington by people who've never stood on the ground. And we know the desertification that we're dealing with is because of not having enough ruminants on the land. And so we are seeing a worse problem of desertification because of, you know, I can only have one cow calf pair per 100 acres. And when you're in a brittle environment like the West, the only thing that's going to break down that biology is the rumen of its livestock that can put it back into the soil. So what, what's your, what would you educate us on in terms of like how that all plays in? Cause it does, like if we're going to increase, if we're going to put tariffs on imports, well then we, that means we naturally have to start increasing domestic cattle. Well, that's going to be then prohibit, prohibited or prevented by certain regulations that are in place because Western watershed decided they were going to get a bunch of money from who knows where and fight tooth and nail to kick the cattle off. <laughs> so, well, there's all kinds of stuff happening with water rights right now yeah. out here. Yeah. If you don't have your water's not old, it's going to be taken. Yeah. My dad has it all written down. He has to went to the water meeting, but and then we were checking. He was letting me know, like, let me know how old our water is and the water that we're getting. You got to have like to be safe and it's only safe up to a certain date. But if you don't got water, that's like from the 1940s, they're going to be taking it all new water, taking it. Yeah. So it's like all kinds of, it's just a snowball effect of lots of people connected and it's just all working against what we're trying to save so we can survive and depend on one another. Well, the, the uncontested rule is control the food, control the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a national policy in the United States up until about just over a generation ago. And that was we wanted to populate um, rural areas. Uh, there is a the government would help producers move out west and and do what uh, what nature intended on these arid lands and that was to be grazed by ruminant animals like cattle sheep and buffalo now buffalo were there first and uh, suddenly uh, the, the government has the winds have changed they have decided we want to depopulate the west we do not want producers out there, um, regardless of the negative impact that that has on the e economies, the rural communities, the churches, the schools, um, the, just, just the way of life. And so there's been a concerted effort to reduce uh, the number of livestock that are grazing on these federally managed lands. Um, and uh, it was known at the time when they were promoting the grazing on these federally managed lands that this is what you needed for fire suppression. This is what you needed to contain, to prevent uh, devastating forest fires like we've seen here in recent years, but they have coincided with the reduction in the um, number of, of livestock that are being grazed. And of course, you lose your economic base and you lose the counties and the, the states lose their tax structure. And pretty soon they get into arrears and uh, and they blame the producer. And now you have on layered on top of this, layered on top of a policy where they want to depopulate um, these federally managed lands and reduce grazing. And despite the, the, the harm to the economy that that creates, uh, particularly by um, not being able to contain fires, um, despite that. So now we have this effort. Um, as you've indicated, Brooke, and that was uh, calling cows demons. The, the cows are destroying the planet. Now, uh, cows, buffalo, and sheep are all ruminant animals, and they all produce whatever level of methane they're going to produce. And they've done it for eons. Uh, they've done it throughout our history. And so now we've replaced uh, one ruminant for another. We've replaced uh, the buffalo with cows for the most part. And, uh, and now there's a, a concerted effort uh, to point the finger at, at the cows and say, those of you who are running cattle are destroying our planet. So why would they do that? Um, why wouldn't they point their fingers at the aviation industry or the automobile industry or some other industry? Why are they focused on the, on the independent cattle producers? And it's because of the low hanging fruit. 
um, they don't have the organ the resources to fight back as all other uh, corporate based industries in America have. So uh, they're focusing on the low hanging fruit and they've started uh, in the Netherlands and in Ireland. Uh, they want control over uh, production of food. And the way to do that is to, um, we're gonna talk about it later, I think, um, identify cattle and once you identify them, you begin to manage them. And once you can manage them, then you decide, all right, we've got a, we've got a mandate that we have to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 30%, for example. So we'll just eliminate tens of thousands of cows. And they, they go back with a, a government edict to, to producers and say, you eliminate cattle or we're going to take your land. We're going to confiscate your land. So we're, we're seeing that now in America. So now as we try to uh, impart some responsibility and common sense on uh, the need to graze these federally managed lands in the West, now we have on top of that the, the battle over whether or not cows are destroying the planet. Cows are the solution. Uh, to uh, regenerative, uh, a regenerative environment. And it's, uh, the cows are unique. They can convert uh, grass that is unsuitable for human consumption and provide one of the best and most nutritious protein products uh, known to man. And so um, it, it's, all, it's all part and parcel to what we've experienced. And it all began just over a generation ago. It was a shift in Washington that we can begin to control the food production. And the way to do that is to eliminate producers. And by the way, since the federal government controls these federally managed lands, that's an easy place to, re to eliminate producers. And so once you brought the number of producers down to the optimal level, now in the hog industry, it appears to be 60,000 producers. That's, they've wiped out nine out of every 10 of them in four decades, they're down to 60,000. That appears to be what the multinational meat packers want is just 60,000 producers. We don't yet know what the magic number is in the cattle industry. Uh, we know it wasn't 1.3 million where we were in 1980. We know it wasn't 729,000 where we were in 2017, and we doubt it's 622,000 where we are in 2022. This is a long-term downward trajectory, loss of cattle producers, long-term downward trajectory in the loss of the size of our mother cow herd. We're, we're 8 million mother cows smaller today than we were four decades ago. And it's a long-term downward trajectory in the number of marketing outlets available to producers. And those are what we call farmer feeders, small feedlots uh, that have a, a capacity of less than a thousand head. We, we wiped out 86,000 of them in the course of 25 years. 78% of the feedlots that were in business just in the mid nineties are gone today. So the industry is shrinking and shrinking at an alarming rate. And it's not because of drought. Yes, we had a widespread drought in 2011 to 2013. We had another one started at the beginning of July of 2020, lasted through 2022. But these are long-term, decades-long downward trajectories. Our industry is shrinking because of a long-term lack of profitability. Our industry is shrinking because uh, the policies have catered to the multinational meat packers at the expense of the producers and even the consumers. And so we can predict the future. If we do not initiate significant reforms for this industry, we can predict based on these long-term downward trajectories as any economist could, that we will continue to have fewer and fewer cattle producers. We will uh, threaten our national food security greater and greater every year. We will have fewer cows in our, in our factory, in our mother cow herd, and we will have fewer marketing outlets for independent cattle producers, meaning the control that uh, they will be under by the highly concentrated meat packers will grow exponentially. And so we must initiate significant reforms for this industry and, and it will address all of these issues, federally managed lands. And uh, one of our uh, members you know, calls this, this is really a freedom and liberty issue uh, because what they're attacking is rural America. And this is where the resources are. And this is what you must control if you want to control the food system in America. And uh, we better fight against it. It's, um, and that's what we're doing. Uh, I, I mentioned to you the Red Famine. And my listeners are probably tired of hearing this. But until y'all read it, I'm going to keep bringing it up because mm -hmm. it's important. They did the consolidation of farms. But what they, the way they enacted that is they sent 
what they called the intelligentsia, and they had a different name for them, a, a Russian name for them. But these were people that they sent out of urban environments because they had conditioned them to believe a certain thing about rural rural Russia, rural Ukraine, right? The, the people, in other words, and they sent them into those towns and those villages to regulate and control them on behalf of Stalin because that's how it was done. Well, and it was because there was that disconnect. Urban, the, the, the people, the intelligentsia, the politicians, the, the people that were that were created by that organization were then sent out to control the grain, pull it into the kingdom, so to say, right? Just as kings of old, you just grew it for them. And that's how it happened. And then, then all of a sudden, they couldn't reach those quotas because it was impossible because of the regulations that were put in place. And now it's impossible. Now it's your fault. You, the producer, it's your fault. You're not doing a good enough job. You know, one of the things I've heard producers talk about is the idea that there's a possibility that the blame for soil degradation and all these other things might come back around to the producer, even though it was the big corporations promoting herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, the things that killed the soil, they're going to point back. It's your fault. Well, no, it was, it was those companies on behalf of the federal government that wanted them to increase the production of forage or, or food on that plot of land that pu pushed and promoted the idea. Grandpa would have never changed from the multi-species farm, you know, enterprise model had he not been, you know, magic fairy dust sprinkled on the ground and all of a sudden it's four times the crop yield. He didn't know any better, but they're going to point back. The concern is they're going to point back and say, it's your fault. And, om and omit that it was them that created that movement in the first place for the purpose of control, for the purpose of saying, now we're going to take your land and move you into these 15 minute cities. I mean, it's, it's written down. This isn't a, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's in writing. It is their, their intention or their plan. I, I want to move into, cause I want, we uh, we're already over an hour and something that I heard being discussed about the uh, sustains act is probably one of the most concerning things for me listening to it. Um, so let's go into that. And I think we'll be able to kind of tie in RFID that you alluded to, because that's all, I mean, there, there's so many, so many worst case scenarios happening that your organization is working against all at once, that that's what we're really trying to get the consumer to know is like, when we talk about being under attack, they are throwing every single thing at our food supply they possibly can from all different angles. So Brooks, go ahead and play that clip for us. I will do that. And this is my, I, I need, I need to ask a question. Okay, go for it. Bill, are they executing their end game strategy now? They're midway. Um, so I, I don't think that they reduced the number of producers down to the level that, that, that they would view to be optimal. Uh, but I think we are very, very close to the end game. Uh, we're at a turning point now uh, mm. because so you must have a, a certain um, infrastructure, a competitive infrastructure that, that will sustain a vibrant industry nationwide. When you lose that infrastructure, when you lose your participants, when you lose your number of cows, when you lose your marketing outlets, when you lose packers, it's game over. And so we still have, with 622,000 producers left, we still have the critical mass to sustain the semblance of a competitive infrastructure in an industry that can be rebuilt. But we're soon to reach the point of no return. Once we eliminate, any one of those three components of that competitive infrastructure to the point where it can't can't be rebuilt, it's game over. So it's it's game over for the hog industry. Uh, they are vertically integrated. They're controlled from the top down by the packer. If you want to be a hog producer, you do it by invitation. You have to ask to be invited into the industry so you can get a contract. Uh, they it's game over for the chicken industry. It's now completely controlled where the, the meat packers actually owning the birds, the feed and and essentially dictating to the farmer, you know, how they will uh, produce the corporation's chickens. And it's nearly game over for the sheep industry. Seventy four percent of all the lamb eaten in America comes from uh, Australia, New Zealand. Seventy four percent. They captured seventy four percent of the domestic market. And so the sheep industry's competitive infrastructure is, is devastated. 
So we are close to the point of no return. We're not there yet, but we're we're nearing the end game. Yes. Thank you for that. And uh, AJ, just for your reference, at the end, when this is over, I'm going to have some commentary. Okay. Uh, that will be important to share. So uh, as AJ referenced, this is Brett Kinsey on the Sustain Act, about 90 seconds. But this article talked about the Senate bill and the House bill, the House bill being the Sustains Act that you just read. And yeah, the first the first line really catches you. With respect to the acceptance and use of contributions for public private partnerships and for other purposes. So we now have a bill in government that is making legal and accepted public private partnerships. So if we stop for a minute, the reason that that offends me so much is because I think that as Americans, we are the descendants of people that fled concentrated power, be it through the church in England or the King of England. That's what we fled to. We had the people that created this country had a real power, a real fear of concentrated power. And that's why we have checks and balances built in to throughout our government. You know, co the House of Representatives is supposed to represent the people. The Senate was supposed to represent the states. The president is supposed to take all those laws, tie them together and execute them. And so they have to play on each other with checks and balances to make sure power doesn't accumulate. And what the Sustains Act does is it basically codifies concentrated power by allowing corporations and private groups to have a direct partnership with the United States government. Right. And the, so in other words, bribery is no longer a concern because you don't need to, you can just go and pay them outright. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Uh, provide your context for us on that. I mean, this is why when you're talking about the the whole, I mean, really a big part of our conversation is discussing, we've got to create fair competition and let the consumer decide. This is a direct affront to just wiping out, like you said, one of the biggest challenges for RCAF and really anybody going against the system is the financial ability to play at the same level because of, because they've already, they've had such a lead, such a head start uh, to, to bring all that revenue into their own coffers. How do you, if, if this becomes real, how do you, I mean, that's kind of the end game. What's your, what's your thoughts on this whole safe act? Or so th this allows uh, the major corporations to make contributions to the U S department of agriculture, um, to influence the type of programs that the department of agriculture will impose on or provide to, uh, independent farmers and ranchers. And so it, it's, um, it's unprecedented because it, it allows the corporations to buy the opportunity for the U.S. government to promote them as a sponsor to these programs. It provides the opportunity for these corporations um, like JBS, like uh, Brazil-owned JBS or Chinese-owned Smithfield to actually make a contribution and earmark the money for a particular environmental concern the corporation may have. And then it allows the corporation to share in any environmental service benefits that are derived from the project that they funded through the government. And are, are so they're getting not just government sponsorship and promotion, the government has, has carved out a way for them to actually take those, they'd be called, they'd be the carbon offset credits, to take the carbon offset credits from the project uh, that the government helped them influence. And then, um, and they, they're calling this greenwashing now. And then the corporation can say, look, uh, we've reduced our environmental foot, uh, footprint because they, they bought these carbon credits from the farmer and rancher to offset their footprint. So they can claim that they have uh, been responsible stewards of the environment when they haven't changed a single thing in their practice. All they did was gave money to the government who then encouraged the farmer and rancher to in engage in some project that they are able to, and I think artificially, artificially calculate what these uh, carbon sequestration uh, sequestering uh, is. And then they give that credit back to the 
uh, corporation. This is a huge boon for the corporation. This is this is all part of their ongoing effort to you know define the framework within which they operate uh, to ensure that they receive the bene- benefits at the expense of the producers and the consumers. Hmm. And so, let's just bring in the RFID right now because that's another tool to help them really get uh, have control. I mean, see exactly what they want. I mean, imagine, I, I picture they have this master, you know, software dashboard that that only those people get to have. And they can see everything that's going on across every one of their competitors. We don't get to see inside of what they've got going on, but they can have access because of their relationships and see everything that you and anybody else that's got a dozen head of cattle up across the nation that's an independent producer you know, I don't, I'm not saying that that exists, but in my mind, I'm like, this is, this is the transparency that they're going to receive that nobody else has. It's like seeing an opponent team and knowing every play they're going to call before this, you know, before the snap is, it's, right. it's unbelievable. <clears throat> so, so the cattle industry is the last frontier uh, for the government corporate partnership to control the industry. So it, it's still comprised of over half a million independent producers scattered across the United States. And, and there's something about them. They're fiercely independent. Uh, they're, they're least likely to join any organization. We have a heck of a time getting members out of that group of folks because they're just plain fiercely independent. And uh, so and they don't receive government price supports for their cattle. So they're not controlled under the farm bill subsidies that go to crop producers. The cattle industry has prided itself on living and dying in a competitive marketplace and not receiving government price support. So that's been a problem um, because you can't control them if they're not a recipient of some of these government programs. And so now you've got um, uh, an industry that's the last frontier and the government wants to control it and, and not just national. I mean, this is, this is global. Mm. Uh, the world organization for animal health with the French acronym OIE is attempting to establish standards that every country needs to meet in order to facilitate trade uh, among countries on a global basis. And they are pushing the United States hard. The OIE is pushing the United States hard to implement a government controlled mandatory animal identification system. And they've been pushing our government to do that. And, and the United States wants to comply. Uh, they want to be good, uh, good partners amongst these 160 organizations that are formed in the World Trade Organization. Not to mention that most of those countries don't like the United States, but in any event, um, the, the US wants to demonstrate its leadership capabilities by being an early adopter. Of, of what the WTO is trying to mandate on other countries. And so the, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been trying to implement a national animal identification system since the mid 2000s. They wanted every single animal to be identified with what's called a radio frequency identification ear tag, RFID ear tag. And, and they wanted all cattle producers to do what they've never done, to register their premises, their property, their land, their their ranches, uh, where they raise their cattle, what pastures they move the cattle. They wanted uh, the producers to register their premises with the federal government. So we're all in a single spreadsheet. Um, So apparently these cows, you know, they're uh, like automobiles and and, uh, firearms. You know, we register those. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now we're going to add cows. Um, Oh, and um, your home garden. And your home garden. Oh, yeah. Home gardens, guys. Bad, right. bad for the environment, apparently. Right. Thanks, Bill Gates. So, so, I do have a question in terms of like almost on the health side. So like we know now, I couldn't tell you when we started knowing this, but like in terms of like frequency, like our cell phones, radiation, right? Wi-Fi, 5G, <laughs> how bad it is for us, how bad it is for our health, how bad it is for kids because of what they're growing up in. It's like, do you think that that could be or that would be a topic that is brought up in the fight against electric frequent using basically EMF on ear tags right there on the animal can't be good for them. So that, um, so that's an area that I I have little knowledge, but very closely related to that is 
where do these chips come from that they're putting in those cow's ears? And uh, we, we formally asked the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture because they provided us with a list of eight main manufacturers that make these RFID ear tags. And we specifically asked, are they coming from uh, the, the Communist uh, Chinese Party? And we've got no answer. <laughs> we believe that all of these chips are manufactured in China. Now, China just sent a surveillance balloon across the United States recently. What are they doing? Uh, might it be important for them to know where the food is, uh, where the food is being produced? Um, can they get that with an electronic chip that, that they have embedded uh, in a plastic ear tag and required every cattle producer to affix? So, so your EMF concerns, I, I think, just just got magnified because <laughs> yeah. now now we're dealing with uh, oh, surveillance. Um, so, so that was back in the mid 2000s. That's what the government wanted. They wanted absolute control over the cattle industry. And we fought back and many organizations, uh, independent groups fought back and we succeeded. We stopped the government and uh, they, they tried uh, again in 2009. They made a run at it again and they they scaled back. They, this was a National Animal Identification System, which we called NACE. This was NACE Light. They said, all right, now we're not going to require all the animals to be uh, RFID tagged and recorded. Now we're going to start with the adult animals. So they passed a, a, a rule, they implemented a rule that said that all adult cattle that cross state lines have to be individually identified with either a RFID ear tag or a metal ear clip or a back tag or a brand and tattoo. So they gave producers flexibility to achieve their goal of having the animals, the adult animals that cross state lines identified. And the industry pretty much said, we're okay with it. You know, give, we have the flexibility. But then all of a sudden, uh, th this was passed in 2013. And then in 2019, and, and they promised you as, the government promised producers you will have flexibility because they said we don't need the electronic format to achieve our disease traceback goals. We can do that with other forms of identification, and these are the ones you can use. So that was a promise the government made to producers. Well, in 2019, the Secretary of Agriculture issued a policy notice and said, on January 1 of 2023, the only approved ear tag will be a RFID ear tag. It must be a radio frequency. No rulemaking. And so uh, we hired Harriet Hageman at the time was uh, working with the New Civil Liberties Alliance. She represented us and we sued the government. We said, it's unlawful for you to mandate uh, what you just passed in a rule uh, and, and deprive the producers of the very flexibility you promised. And we succeeded and USDA withdrew its, its policy but it kept coming back. And now at the latest uh, iteration is it's back again. It wants to uh, require all adult cattle crossing state lines to be affixed with a mandatory radio frequency identification ear tag. But we know that this is phase one. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step will be all cattle. As soon as a calf hits the ground, must have a radio frequency identification ear tag. The cattle producer must register the premises and it must all, um, all of their numbers in the movements recorded. Every time an animal is moved, it will be recorded on this uh, database. And so once you have that level of control over an industry, remember I talked about the independents and why they don't join anything and they're not recipients of uh, direct price supports from the government. Um, they're, they're the last frontier. They got you. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. And we're seeing it in, the, in Ireland and the Netherlands. How did they know that when they said, we want to reduce the, car, the in, um, environmental footprint of the cattle industry in, in Ireland and in the Netherlands? And we, so they, they look at their spreadsheet and said, oh yes, up in this Northeast region, we have, for example, uh, we have a high concentration of cattle. Let's eliminate 20% out of that group. And they can play their game sitting at their desk. Um, and play with the lives of all of the producers who have been told that they must now uh, eliminate cows from the herd, rendering them uneconomical. I mean, 
here in America, uh, we've been experiencing a cost price squeeze. Cattle producers have been exiting at the rate of 20,000 uh, a year. Uh, it's an unprofitable industry. We have to fix it. And now you're going to impose another cost on the industry and gain the control. You're going to force the producer to pay for a tag that where the chip was manufactured uh, in communist China. This is just. Um, yeah. Then you add it. it sorry. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the phrase is. Sometimes the truth is uh, more remarkable and, and unbelievable than fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what's going on. Well, and I imagine, too, the other other things that that I mean, as a whole, that's a major issue. But imagine they pass it and all the other little things they'll be able to do that go with that to get them out of business. It's just to get their foot yeah, in the door. I mean, like, yeah. Like, it's you give them an inch, they take yeah. a mile and, and they can. And that's probably the thing, too. What kind of people are they working with? Yeah. Good people. So it's good people. Th and then all they have to do is they have the money. It's like, oh, they'll give us this. But soon they won't have the money to fight back the next time we do it or the next time we do it and the next time you do it. And that is why, as consumers, we need you. The industry needs you because together is the only way we keep freedom, yeah. <laughs> really. So once the government mandates, we're fighting to stop them. But if they mandated RFID, so every animal is tagged. And here's how they leverage the control that they have. You have four packers controlling 85% of the market. All the packers have to do is say, we will not purchase your cattle unless you have purchased feed from our approved suppliers unless you have uh, uh, built your corrals uh, to meet our approved standards and and they've got you yeah. they now have control over the production of food in america it's been a partnership between the government and the corporations the government imposes and, and maintains the database and the marketing outlets themselves uh, are gatekeepers and they determine what are the criteria that the u.s producer must meet if they want the privilege of selling cattle uh, in the United States. Yeah. And the producer or the, the, the congressman or Senator that entered office with a net worth of six figures leaves with nine. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're seeing here. So, and a rancher starts out with nine figures and <laughs> yeah. loses it all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My uncle told me that a long time ago, if you want to be a millionaire rancher, start with 10 million. And yeah. I was like, Oh, okay. So, well, so we've, I mean, we've covered a lot and we didn't even get into the deep, I mean, we just don't have time. It's just how many things we're being assaulted by. Like, uh, I would love to learn more about, um, you know, the dangers of this whole carbon sequestration, carbon credits. I mean, we, we, you touched on it a little bit, but let's wrap up here and just, um, how do we fix it? What do you, what do you see is, what, what do we need? What do you need? What does our calf need? What do we need? To What's the low hanging fruit? Yeah. <laughs> how, do we yeah, how, do we, how do we take a step forward so that we can then take the next step forward in your, in your opinion? Well, so there aren't enough of us to overcome the overwhelming power of the forces against us. The ones who want, who are just happy as larks with the way things are today the ongoing shrinking of the cattle industry, loss of producers, loss of cows. So we need to enlist the help of consumers. Um, this is a national food security issue uh, and, and consumers understand liberty and freedom uh, where you know the, the government and the corporations are trying to control producers. Well, they'll be next um, in their homes, in, in rural areas and in city areas. So this is all about uh, whether we will defend our freedom, our liberty, and a competitive marketplace. And so our emphasis is on the competitive marketplace. We need consumers to engage. We, we, we invite consumers to call their members of Congress and say, why can't I know where my beef comes from that I feed my children and grandchildren and family? Um, we need consumers, we want consumers to be engaged and to say, we support the family farm um, and we're losing them at, a, at an alarming rate. What are you going to do about it? You need to start listening to groups that are proposing solutions. But consumers understand country of origin labeling. They have it on all their other um, goods and, and clothing that they purchase. They understand that they have choices there. Um, and so this is an issue that this is an easy issue for consumers to get involved with. 
We, they want to know where their food comes from. And it's Congress that has to give them that opportunity, that has to provide that information. Nobody else will. So they must call their two senators and their members of Congress. Um, and then uh, for what else they can do is we have to get back to um, um, respecting and the family farm system of agriculture as a structure. Uh, consumers need to prefer that their food is produced by family farmers as opposed to some corporate giant uh, that is, um, you know, has a lagoon outside the city limits, something like that. So there are things consumers can do, but they have to be engaged. And this, their food is the issue that they should be engaged with. Um, and, and, you know, listening to your podcast here, just getting a basic understanding of, of what is wrong with the system is the first step in providing a solution. And so we, of course, would invite them to join with us and to go to our website. Uh, you know, for Country of Origin Labeling, for example, they can go to labelourbeef.com um, and find information about Country of Origin Labeling. And they can support us. We have a, a membership. We have voting members who must own cattle. And we have associate members who are supporting consumers that don't own cattle, uh, but they like beef and they, they want to support the American family farmer and ranchers. So, Well, and that's the plug I would give for RCAF after attending your conference last year and then being engaged you know, for over a year now. To the consumer that's listening, uh, RCAF... It, you know, we promote shake the hand that feeds you. That's the whole mission of From the Farm. Shake the hand that feeds you. If you have that direct relationship, if you know your farmer and rancher, you're always going to have food because you can you'll have their back. You know, like like what's happening to Amos Miller, uh, you know, the the Amish producer back east. Um, if if uh, if the consumer audience or the consumers were that closely connected, personally connected to their producers that when an issue showed up, it was not just a threat to the producer. It's a threat to all of those people who rely on that source of food, their families, it's a real threat to them. And so they rally behind the producer. And so my, my invitation for our listeners is, is to join our calf and support them. Don't see that as an agricultural, don't see our calf as for the rancher, see it as for us, for us, the people, because um, you know, we, there is so much to do. I'm grateful that you guys are doing your work because I get sent so many videos of all these issues and I have a level of peace and comfort knowing that Bill, you and your team are the ones going to Washington and putting through these uh, lawsuits to, to stop it or to slow it down. Cause if you weren't doing your thing while we're doing ours or vice versa, that's a, that's a ball that's not being carried forward. And so consumers, if you're listening to this and you really want to make sure your food supply chain is secure, support our calf, get behind them, help fund these initiatives that they're trying to do by becoming a member. It's 150 bucks for an entire year, but that in, 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 in a group environment, 150, you know, we've got enough people that are waiting for from the farm to launch that if even just a portion of you guys supported that mission at our calf, it would, uh, it would give them the ability to fight. Like Bill said, they, they pushed through the, the RFID once it got knocked down and they pushed it through again. And this is what they do. Two step forward, one step back, two step forward, one step back until they finally, they, they're just relentless. And we have to be equally relentless and just stand for it. So uh, uh, check out RCAF and get behind them and, and really give these guys the opportunity to go and, and fight for our food sovereignty, our food freedom. And talk about this with people, you know, yeah, you know, talk about it. If you're listening to this podcast and you live in a situation similar to every one of us here where majority of people out and about, they just don't want to know. They just don't want to hear about it. You know, they're comfortable with their life. They're fine the way it is. They like things that are easy to have and they don't have to try very hard and you, know, you can all work from home. You know, just this really easy lifestyle, share it with them, share it with them. Even just clips from the podcast. All we need is every time they come back, is for the line to get bigger, for more people to have the ranchers' backs. Yeah. Every time. So share it with your friends. Um, get them listening to it because this is necessary. Yeah. That's one of our missions is that at, at the end of the day, when we accomplish what our mission is, it means we have millions of consumers who've become wise to what's happening, 
with their food supply chain so that when our calf call sounds the alarm on something like RFID, like the sustain act, like M cool, like, I mean, all the things we're discussing that you actually have the ability to say, okay, this is real information. That's going to affect me. I'm going to show up to the polls and make sure that doesn't happen. That's, that's a major component to what we're trying to accomplish here is to aggregate consumers to a level where they're listening. They want to hear what's being done. And, the experts like yourselves, you know, I, I'm very careful to tell people I am not the expert, but I've spent enough time shaking the hand as, of as many experts as I can. So if you, it's like Henry Ford, Henry Ford was being sued for not knowing how to build a transmission for, for just, he was being sued for not graduating high school. And so one of the arguments at, in court, when they were trying to remove him as the board of director as, from the board of his own company, the, uh, the prosecuting attorney said, Mr. Ford, you never even graduated high school, did you? He said, no, sir, I never did. And he goes, do you even know how to build a transmission? And he says, come to my office. I've got a row of buttons on my desk. If you want to know how to build a transmission, I'll push a button. And within five minutes, the world's greatest transmission builder will be standing in front of you. The lawsuit was over. That's what we're here to do. We're not, we're not, I don't have time. We've got to focus on the, the, the competitive marketplace. That's what we're building. That's enough work as it is. I don't have time to go and become so detailed and special, a specialist at what you guys do. And that's why consumers, we need you to support all of us. You are, we are in trouble. Like Bill said that we are not at the end game, but it's the 11th hour. So any last words, Bill, from, from you, from our calf, anywhere they can find you, how, how would you like the, the audience to engage with you? Well, they can go to our website at r-calfusa.com. They can call us at 406-252-2516 and visit our Facebook page um, and Twitter account uh, that we also have. Great. And Brooks, you had something to offer as we closed here. Go ahead. Thank you, AJ. <clears throat> Bill doesn't quite know me so well, but AJ, Brooke, and the audience do. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to keep me with my mouth closed for an hour and 37 minutes. You did yeah. really good. <laughs> I released my first podcast in 2011. Been on hundreds of shows, created hundreds of episodes myself, possibly going on thousands. This is the most compelling conversation I've had the opportunity to sit in on in the entire time that I have been doing this. That's the first thing I want to say. The second is I uh, sometimes the best way I can describe myself is with buttons. This is how I'm feeling right now. I've never been so irate in my whole fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cause of that feeling, which is the totalitarian tiptoe, the totalitarian tiptoe, which Bill has been watching steadily tiptoe for decades now. And this is the reason why they're tiptoeing. Profitability and health actually are at odds. One more time for the people in the back. Profitability and health actually are at odds. Profitability and health are at odds. Um, and my... My, my closing statement is this is the most compelled I've been that if Bill was like, you know what, Brooks, I need your help. Can you drop everything and help me right now? I actually would. This, what Bill has done for me today is highlight the totality, the, the totality of the situation. And man, it seems so dire with what I already know to be true in other areas of my life and have observed, have made content to deconstruct, you know, and food is so vital. It is so much of the human experience to see the level of intentional dismantling and uh, systematic control that has been executed on the American population and on the global cop population the only word that I have for it is evil, like pure. And I don't say that lightly, pure, unadulterated evil executing an agenda on the world. And I am at, I mean, I'm so livid. I'm about lost for words, but I just want to say thank you, Bill, for coming on the show and, and, and bringing these things to the table because 
What you've described today is so, it may be the most pressing issue of our time. It may be on any level at all. This may be the most pressing issue facing the entire world. And as someone who has an MBA, I study globally, I'm a recovering global elitist. I've, I've known that the RFID uh, agenda has been on the table for at minimum two decades. They want to control literally every resource on the planet because they're so smart and they got it all figured out. They want to control every resource on the planet. And man, if there is just one place where I'm drawing the line in the sand, it's my damn food, <laughs> period. It's my damn food. And Bill, you have empowered me beyond belief with not only information, but also purpose. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. AJ, any broke, any final words? Bill, any final words? Y'all feeling good? As always for me, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here today. And um, don't forget to shake the hand that feeds you. <laughs> And that is episode, thank you, Bill. And that is episode 18 of the, for now, Feed the People podcast. I'm your producer. I just want to say, Bill, thank you so much. I hope I get to shake your hand one day soon. And uh, we would, I I know we, I'm going to speak for all of us, would love to have you back on because there's so much more conversation that we still need to have. Maybe maybe we can pull you aside at the conference this year. It's in June in uh, Deadwood? Deadwood. Deadwood. So. Thank God for Bill Bullard. Thank God for RCAF. And uh, thank God for from the thank God for from the farm app coming up. Thank Thank you very much. And that is a wrap for episode 18 of the Feed the People podcast. We are your humble hosts and producers. And in the meantime, shake the hand that feeds you.